One of the amazing things I believe is beautiful is that in the history of the church, whenever the Lord, whenever God chooses someone for a special vocation, a special ministry, it's never usually the, the top choice that in the world would see this. We, we see this, of course, in the scriptures. We, we, look at, we look at Joseph, of course, and he being one of the youngest sons. We look at David himself, how small and he was in comparison to everyone else, and he was able to take out the lion. We, of course, see this in the apostles. We see this in saints as well. We see it in Augustine himself, who was living such a, a, a immoral life, and maybe he's one of the greatest teachers now of, of the faith. We see this with John Manning, who failed out of, out of seminary, almost the original Latin. And it seems to me that the Lord chooses in a special way those who the world rejects. We see this today in our first reading as well uh, with, with the prophet Amos. Amos himself admits to us, I'm not a prophet. What is he? He says, I'm a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees. Not exactly a lofty position anywhere. It's really not. A shepherd definitely is not a lofty position, nor is a dresser of sycamore trees. And yet he goes to the prophet as Amaziah, who's trying to kick him out of the temple in Bethel, and says, I'm not doing this because I'm a professional prophet like you are. I'm doing this because the Lord called me. He states at the end of our, our first reading today, the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And so he's there and he's in the northern region of Israel and Amaziah is upset at him because what is Am Amos doing? He's preaching, he's prophesying the truth and yet they want to kick him out. And he's saying, all I am doing is following the will of God. Once again, not exactly someone we'd put up as a, as a high example of someone you necessarily choose as a prophet. We, of course, see this with the apostles as well. Today, Jesus sends out the apostles to go out two by two and to preach the uh, a preach of repentance. This is like John the Baptist. But who are the 12 men that he sends out? We look at the apostles, we know they're not exactly the, the, the top choice. They're not exactly ones that people would choose. You know, about seven, eight years ago, I came across a meditation on, on the apostles in, a, in an aptitude test by them. And I thought, hey, that might be a good idea to put in a homily one of these years. And then about three years ago, Cy Kerber gave me the same exact reflection and said, Father, you have to put this in a homily. So Cy, today is the day you've influenced my homily immensely. Thank you to, to Cy Kerber, because now we're going to read off this beautiful meditation. As you know, Cy has been a longtime parishioner. He's a, he's a great jokester, but he also is a great man of faith. And all the reflections he's ever given me are all based off of faith. Of course, there's a little humor in this as well. But I found this reflection on the apostles to be beautiful. And once again, it's based off the aptitude test. Maybe you've done this yourself. Maybe you've gone to interview for a position, and you have to go through a battery of tests. Well, that's the scenario that the apostles had to do. So they gave the report to Jesus, and they said, Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of, them all of them have taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. The profiles of all tests are included, and you will want to study each of them carefully. As part of our service, we make some, great, some general comments for your guidance, much as an auditor will include some general statements. This is given as a result of our staff consultation and comes without any additional fee, which you know is a false statement if it comes from a consultant, right? There we go. So here we go. It is our staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of organization that you are about to start. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. 
we feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Elpheus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. This is pretty much true if we were to look at the apostles. Only one at first would seem to have any potential. The 11 other ones would never be chosen. They'd be left off the team. And yet Jesus chooses them. We well, you know, of course, what happens to Judas Iscariot. Why does he fall? Why does he fail? Well, there's many reasons why he failed. But one of them was he thought he was better than everyone else. He thought he had it all put together. As we would say back in high school, he thought he was all that. Right? And yet, the other 11 knew that they had issues. The other 11 knew that they were not perfect. And yet, Jesus called them. He said what? He said, follow me. And they did. We go back into, into Mark's gospel in chapter 3. He says, I will make you fishers of men and follow me. And so what do they do to become an apostle? There's actually two main parts of becoming an apostle, which we're all called to do as well. The first part from chapter 3 to chapter 6 is they spent time with Jesus. They witnessed his working of miracles his consoling people, consulting people, going in and driving out demons, curing the sick. And they lived with him. They walked with him. They became like him. And they transformed. And then we hear today in our gospel, what does he do? He sends them out two by two. And this, of course, what it means to be an apostle is to be sent out. And what are they called to do when they're sent out? They're called to go out and let people know about Jesus. They're about to let them, let, them know, let them know about the beauty and the grace that God wants to give them. Yes, they drive out demons, they preach repentance, they heal the sick. But they bring that gospel message of salvation out into the world. And how do they do this? Two by two, witnessing together and living it out. No longer who they were at first when they first encountered Jesus, but rather transformed. And we see this with all of the prophets. We see this with the apostles. We see this with the saints. And hopefully we have seen it with ourselves as well. When we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, take me as I am and transform me, he will as soon as we allow him. We go to our second reading today from the reading of St. Paul to the Ephesians. And what it says over and over again in there is that you are my chosen people. I have a vocation for you. I have a ministry for you. And it may not be the, maybe it is the priest, and maybe it is becoming a religious sister. But no matter what it is, be it that or the glorious vocation of being a husband or a wife or a brother or a sister or just a Christian, this is a special ministry that the Lord wants to bless us in. But he's saying, don't go into it thinking that you're all that. Instead, go into it and say, let me transform you. And when we do this, of course, he will take us from our lowly state. He will raise us up and he will make us in his own image, in his own likeness, to go out and to proclaim the message of God.